Well, good evening, everybody. I say good evening because we're making this video cast uh, in the late afternoon, early evening. Father Jerry Robinson, director of the Newman Center in uh, uh, San Luis Obispo that serves Cal Poly and Cuesta College. And this is our first uh, we, uh, of a series of what we are going, or what we are calling the Spirituality Roundtable. And the purpose here is to consider some uh, uh, <clears throat> information or scripture or whatever it might be that would help us uh, in, the, in the experience of finding God in our personal lives. I'd say that's really the goal of this spiritual uh, roundtable. The way I wrote it down would be to say this, uh, how do we find God in our daily experience? That is what this is about. It's not about how we find God in church. That is a daily experience or a weekly experience that we have where we go to pray or worship. It's not about how we find God in a spiritual book or in a theology class, though those are experiences that we have, reading a spiritual book, praying, going to a theology class, but really the purpose here is God's available to us in all of our experience. And how is it that we can become more aware of that and find God in our daily experience? So I'm going to begin by just saying a few words about me, now that I've said what we're doing. And then I'm going to invite my, my team here, uh, Matt and Betsy, to introduce themselves. So again, as I said, I'm Father Jerry Robinson. I'm a Jesuit priest. Um, I was born in San Francisco. I was thinking of a way of telling you uh, a little bit about what that was like. Uh, I'm going to be 74 years old next week. So I was born in 1947. And I thought the best way to tell you what it was like, although I never knew this in 1947, is gas was 23 cents a gallon when I was born. I looked at, that's what my dad was paid for gas uh, the year that I was born. I, I was raised with two brothers in a Catholic family in San Francisco. I left that out. I was born and raised in San Francisco. I lived there till I was 18 years old. Never lived there again. My parents did. But at the age of 18, after my Catholic uh, grade school and high school education, I went to the Jesuit novitiate. There's a, a lengthy formation program there. It was 12 years later. I was 30 years old in 1977 when I was ordained uh, a priest. And I just wrote down a couple of things. I've been a high school teacher a high school director of campus ministry, a campus minister at a university, the director of a retreat center. For 12 years, I was the pastor of St. Ignatius Parish in Sacramento. And now I'm here at the Newman Center in San Luis Obispo. Um, all through those uh, years, I would say my experience of how to recognize God in my daily life kept uh, transforming and changing. I'm not, you know, you'll know this, we all know this. We're not the same person that we were when we were born or when we were 10 or when I was 18 when I came to the Jesuits or when I was 30 when I was ordained or when I even came here. Uh, this is my fourth year at Cal Poly. So that's just a little bit about me. I, oh, I, I forgot to mention I did have two brothers, one of whom died a number of years ago, and the other of whom lives in San Jose uh, with his wife, and uh, his grown children also live in San Jose, and that's the base for my family now, not San Francisco, but San Jose. So I'm here with two uh, students from Cal Poly who can take a moment to introduce themselves, and then maybe we can move on a little more into the topic. Uh, yeah, my name is Matt. Uh, I come from Lompoc, j j j just down south, and um, I uh, studying here at Cal Poly. I'm an engineering student, and uh, I think I would describe myself as far as faith goes. Uh, I think I would describe myself as a cradle convert. 
I was raised Catholic in a very strong Catholic uh, community and a very strong Catholic family, um, but I definitely have had s several periods of um, disbelief in Catholicism and Christianity and God, uh, but I'm back uh, here in the church and I'm loving being a part of this Newman community and I currently am li living in Faith House, which is one of the Newman community houses. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. I'm Betsy. I'm from a small town in Northern California. It's very small. Uh, it's called Bangor. Um, I grew up very Catholic. My family would pray the rosary every day, so it was a, definitely a big part of my faith, or my uh, growing up. Um, I have five siblings, and I'm currently studying chemistry here at Cal Poly. I love what you said about <coughs> pray, you're in a family that prayed the rosary, Betsy, because I was thinking that's part of my story, is that we didn't pray the rosary. My brother and I have talked about this several times, how we grew up in a very Catholic family, but, and we went to Mass every Sunday, but it was a whole different experience. They were service-oriented. Dad taught catechism. Mom volunteered for everything. The church was, but we weren't praying the rosary at home. We weren't doing all these devotional things that other families were doing, but we sure had our life centered in the church. And my brother has said that several times. Uh, maybe we didn't pray as much as other people, but we did a lot of service uh, to build up that church community. Um, I'd like to say a few more words in general about what we're going to do here, and then kind of the format at this point would be we'll each share a few things about the document that you are all able to take a look at, that short little three-page reflection on conversion that uh, <clears throat> is a product of, uh, that I wrote. So my notion of conversion would be this, that it's not just something that uh, you could say, well, that person was not a Christian and became a Christian, or that person was a Presbyterian and became a Catholic, that we made those kinds of changes that are often very much belief-rooted. You know, like uh, someone, John Henry Newman could say this in a sense, that uh, he, who is our patron of the Newman Centers, that he became a Catholic, uh, from uh, converting from his Anglican faith when he recognized that the deepest truth and foundation of Christianity resided in the Roman Catholic Church, and he felt that he had to lead the Anglicans to do that. And that is definitely a conversion. No one's, I'm not saying it isn't. But I'm saying that conversion is also a experience that changes our action that changes our behavior. It just doesn't happen in our head or what we think or what we believe <clears throat> or that we can somehow recite a series of propositions and uh, say, this is who I am and maybe even convince someone else that they should share these beliefs. That could be very helpful. But conversion is more than what I believe. It has something to do with what happens down here. And I was talking to someone recently, her name is Liz, and <clears throat> she told me a story, and I think that's where we find a lot about conversion. She told me a story, and I don't think she really realized when she told me the story, how it changed her life. And then we explored that story, and she began to see that. So Liz is, uh, uh, retired from her work now. She worked, <clears throat> and one of the things she does is a lot of volunteer service. And she's in a parish that goes several, uh, every other year or so to Guatemala. And she's made six trips to Guatemala in the last 15 years where they do service in rural villages and so forth. And she was describing how at the end of one of their trips, they went as tourists to Antigua, 
to see this uh, city in Guatemala and they would be flying back to the United States the next day. So their service piece was over. And a number of them said they were going to go get a massage. So she went with them, but she said, my back was really sore and I really didn't want a massage, but I was kind of going along with it. And we went into the place and I said, I don't want anyone who's going to push me too hard or whatever. So they assigned, of course, it's all in Spanish. They assigned a woman to help her. And she told her, the woman, I really don't know if I want a massage. I just am here with them. And the woman said, well, let me show you something. And she brought in a card with a prayer that was in English. And she said, I'd like to give you this because you come and serve the people up in the mountains. And Liz took the prayer and she said, now I pray this every day. I've been doing this now for 10 years. And she said, somehow it's completely changed me that she gave me that prayer. That now I kind of, I'm, it, it, it's the way that I offer my day to God by reading this prayer. And she said, of course, I don't read it anymore. I have it memorized now. She says, I, I don't even have to get out of bed to say it. Or I can and kneel beside the bed. But she said, it's, it, it, it's, it transformed me. And the more we talked about it, the more she began to see that even at that point where she was in her early 60s and received this prayer, her life changed because of it. And the last thing she was even thinking when she went into this massage place was that she was going to meet someone who was going to give her a spiritual gift that was going to change her life. And that's kind of the point of this whole spiritual roundtable idea as far as I'm thinking of it. Uh, things happen every day. Sometimes we don't notice it when it happens. We have to look back. Liz didn't notice this when it happened. It was more when we began to talk about it and I said, imagine that. You've been doing that for 10 years. That changed you in a way. And then she started to talk about how it changed her. Things happen every day where God is kind of revealing himself to us in some way that we don't even notice. And that's where conversions happen, you might say, one after the other, after the other, after the other. Um, I put some, a few examples of that in my, uh, the little piece that I wrote, thinking, for instance, of St. Peter, as I, I used him as an example, who received a call to be a fisher of men. But that isn't where it ended. Later on, <clears throat> the call became uh, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, tend my sheep. It took a whole different, uh, it took him to a whole different level. And we can sometimes look at it and say, well, that person became a Catholic. They were converted. And I'm suggesting this conversion happens all the time. And we're often not aware of it. How God is fashioning us and changing us and leading us deeper and more intimately into a union with Jesus. So that's kind of where I'm coming from when I wrote this. And Matt or Betsy, maybe you had a couple of reactions to this that you'd like to share with us, or what you thought of this. You, I, you don't have to agree with me, of course. But that's what makes it rich. What happened for you when you read this? Did it, how was it for you? I definitely like the idea of conversion being an ongoing process, I think. Um, one thing that struck me when I was reading it was how, in the definition, conversion was defined as being radical. And I don't think that's something I necessarily agree with because if it's an ongoing process, I think it happens a lot in the little things, not in these very large things that 
um, kind of show up in your life. I think maybe, like your story about Liz, um, they start off as really small things, and looking back, we can realize how big or how much they impacted our lives. Um, but yeah, I think conversion happens a lot in the little day-to-day things. So, what do you think, Matt? Yeah, I think uh, going off of that, there is a power to the large calls to conversion that Father Jerry was talking about. Like He gave examples like Moses and Jeremiah, among others. Those are very powerful and useful, I think. Um, if you think about, or just like in, I've, I've heard other people say in, in other experiences, like if they're trying to get a project going with engineering or in any type of um, goal that they want to have, in general, it's easier to get people on board with it if it's larger. Because people, you know, they, they want their time to be meaningful. They want their time to be well spent <coughs> in so, something that's inspiring and so, something that makes them excited and makes them want to get out of bed in the morning. And so uh, that was one thing I was th- think, thinking about when, when, when you, you're saying all these large calls to conversion was that those can be very useful, you know, for... Um, for, for inspiration and for um, getting people kind of rattled out of their seats. Um, but I was actually going to say like a very similar thing as you, Betsy, is that what happens when you're called to something that's not exciting? Um, what happens when your call is just like to do your homework, <laughs> which I should have done today? <coughs> or, uh, you know, do you know, just provide for your family. Just get up in the morning and go to work um, and maybe uh, have a small prayer that you do um, uh, every day for 10 years that changes y- your, your life. Well, what if that's your call? Um, where do those kind of reconcile? <laughs> you know, like mm-hmm. these, these two things that we're talking about, like the magnitude of the call, but then also the sustainability of the radical change. Like where does that... Where does that come into play? Where's that line drawn? Yes. I've been thinking, and this is an interesting the way this happens, because when I'm younger, so more like your age or up to 30, when I'm in my formation period, and I'm learning a lot of terms, I don't think I necessarily get what conversion really is all about. Though it's not age-specific, because Teresa of Lisieux, the little flower, she knew what it was all about when she was 18. I didn't. I guarantee you, I didn't. So don't feel like you have to. But there's something that happens where, and I, and I think this is, what, this is a way of looking at what Jesus is about, where you realize life is not, I'm not the center of all of this. And that is, a, that is a big conversion. And then you realize as the years go on, there's more of me I need to let go of and more of love that I need to lean into. Because that's a good little like colloquial way we talk about it. We, we lean into it, you know. Uh, the little flower, Teresa, she gets that from the get-go. Then you take someone like Mother Teresa, who is a nun and very uh, dynamic in her service, and something happens and she says, this is not what I'm supposed to do. And she leaves her religious order and founds a new religious order to serve the dying. How, what happened there that she saw that to be truly selfless, to move more into, lean more into, because I don't want to just say selfless, it's like leaning into love. Teresa, Mother Teresa found that later. She certainly had a vocation when she was younger, like I did, but her discovery of 
how to really love was part of this ongoing conversion, it wasn't all clear to her right in the beginning. I'd say that's been more my experience, which I think is the way it is for most human beings. We keep learning it as we go along. And I'm going to throw one more idea in there, and then I just want to hear what you guys think of it. Um, sometimes we think this is a lot of work. I have to figure out what I'm supposed to do, how I'm supposed to love. And one of my favorite stories about that is from the very beginning. Genesis. Adam and Eve eat this fruit. They realize that they are naked. They make clothes for themselves. And then we come to this little episode here. When they heard, this is in chapter 3 of Genesis, when they heard the sound of the Lord God walking about in the garden at the breezy time of the day, like the afternoon, just like this, the man and his wife hid themselves from the Lord among the trees of the garden. The Lord God called and said, where are you? See, a lot of times we don't realize God's looking for us. We're doing all this work to try and be who God wants us to be. And maybe like Adam and Eve, we're feeling bad because we did the wrong thing or we were selfish. And all God's doing is looking for us. It isn't that hard. But we get so wrapped up in me that we don't see where God is. And that's kind of what I want to be talking about in this roundtable. Does that make any sense to either of you? Have you do, does that resonate with any experience you've had? Or does it just make sense here? Or have you had an experience that connects to that? Yeah, I think one interesting thing that you were saying was that basically conversion is all about your letting go of yourself to an extent. Um, it's like almost the forgetting of, of self for the purpose of, you know, loving others or of, of going out and serving <laughs> others. Um, and one thing that was, that's, I think, at first, I was like, I don't know if I agree with that, because um, one thing with conversion that I think of is that um, I should be focused on myself with conversion and not anybody else. Um, I shouldn't be trying to convert other people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because, well, I, I guess in, in, the, in the colloquial um, interpretation of the word convert, like I'm not gonna go and um, knock on doors necessarily because um, I believe that it's very relationship-based. Um, that's like the most effective way to reach people and to build the strong re relationships in my life and to focus on my own conversion so that um, people, you know, like if, if my faith is something that's attractive, then they'll be attracted to that and attracted to the way that I live. Um, so at first I, I was thinking, I'm not really sure if I, uh, agree with that, that you kind of need to focus on others. Um, but I think they're basically, I think we're saying the same thing in that when, when, when you say focus on others, it's not to convert them, it's to serve them mm -hmm. um, and to, to love them and to forget yourself through that as, pro, as a <coughs> process and part of your conversion, which then uh, leads others to that same path. Um, Yeah, I, I don't know what Betsy thinks, but I'm going to throw this idea in, and then you can take a shot at it. Um, <clears throat> this, what happens as I'm looking at it with Adam and Eve in the garden is they're so focused on what they did wrong. None of us have that problem that we ever write. <laughs> no, we do. We get to live with guilt, and we have to deal with that. They are so focused on what they did wrong that they don't even know that God is looking for them. They're, it's almost like they're hiding. 
They've hid themselves in the trees. And God isn't there to beat them up. God is there to invite them uh, to come back, to be who they could be. I see that, I, I guess I see that as a part of conversion, that we can become so self-conscious about we're unworthy or we're big surprise, we're sinners, you know. Although we can chuckle at that, we don't really like to admit it, you know. <laughs> but we're so unworthy. It's better to use a word like that. We're just not good enough. And yet God is looking for us. He's looking for Moses. He's looking for Peter. He's looking for Mother Teresa. He's looking for Teresa of Lisieux. He's looking for Jeremiah. Believe it. I didn't know that, that he was looking for me. But I found out eventually that he was and is. And that's kind of part of what I want to say about conversion, because we can be hiding. I, I, don't, I don't know about you. I can be hiding. I can say, I don't know that I want to get involved in that or do that. What's that going to cost me? How hard is that going to be? And God is, conversion is when I start, when I'm led to not say it's about me. It's about something else, which I'm saying is love. Your really, turn, Betsy, if you have a thought. <laughs> I, I really like that thought, actually. Um, because I think it's, yeah, like you said, it's very easy to get caught up in our brokenness. Mm -hmm. um, kind of like Adam and Eve. And in that story, um, God gave them so many opportunities to turn to him. Like he, they heard him walking. And God doesn't need to make sounds when he walks. Mm -hmm. That was him giving them an opportunity to come out um, and to convert. Mm -hmm. um, and then he called out to them. And that was another chance that they had. <coughs> um, and I think the thing that I like about that story is that it kind of gives you comfort in that it lets you know that it's never too late to convert, to have that change of heart, because God is always going to be giving you more chances. And obviously that doesn't mean waste your chances. Um, but, and I think that comes um, along with letting go of um, being caught up in your brokenness, is that you have to accept <coughs> the fact that you've made mistakes and that you've turned away from God and turn down his chances um, in order to open up yourself I think to the possibility of new chances and uh, turn your, turning yourself back towards God so I like that that story I like how you connected that I've never heard of it connected that way <laughs> I sometimes I'm yeah I think I had heard it before but it just seemed like I had to say that today because I added it. It wasn't there in what I gave you originally. Yes. <laughs> but I, yeah. I, it, it, seemed, it just, they are hiding because they're embarrassed or ashamed, probably ashamed, a little more than embarrassed. And God is just saying, I'm looking for you. I'm, I'm loving. Why don't you try it? You know, instead of being so ashamed of yourselves. And that's, for me, what conversion is in our daily experience. Uh, God's trying to set us, inviting us to be more free and not trapped in our negative feelings about ourselves. Um, St. Peter is a great example of that because he keeps going back into his old self, you know, uh, come be a fisher of men. Who do people say that I am? They say you're the Christ, the Son of God. Well, you know what's going to happen to me. I'm going to be handed over and put to death and then Peter launches into being his old self. No, that's not going to happen to you. 
And Jesus lays it on him pretty hard. Get behind me, Satan, you know. Um, because somehow Peter gets caught in something selfish there rather than hearing what Jesus is trying to say that, th that this, <clears throat> this, this whole thing about love, that it means letting go of yourself. Anyway, I got a little carried away there, but uh, yeah. conversion is not, you know, this is what I wanted to get at. The second part of that essay, where, which is the little piece of theology that I threw in there, where Bernard Lonergan explains that we kind of fell into this dogma doctrine uh, approach to conversion. And there's nothing wrong with dogma and doctrine. We have to know what we believe, and we have to be able to have words to say what it is. And when someone says, oh, what do you mean when you say Jesus is in the Eucharist? I mean, we may not all of us be able to explain transubstantiation, but we have some way that we can explain to people what we mean by that. But that's not our faith. The Eucharist is ultimately, to just stick with that, it's our food, our communion with Jesus and with one another that empowers us to go out and love. That's what, our, that's, that's what Lonergan's getting at. It's not just that I know the doctrine of the Eucharist, but that, like St. Augustine says, you become what you eat, which was Augustine's definition comment about the Eucharist 10 centuries, 15 centuries before Lonergan wrote what he wrote. So anyway, I'm just saying conversion is about behavior and practice and not just, and that's why I threw that little theology piece in there. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. I do think that the, the <laughs> theology part is, is a very important part of conversion, though. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can have one without the other. Because it's like you said, you have to know what you believe. Um, and I think that's where that comes in. Mm -hmm. And also, I think it can be dangerous to focus too much on feeling. Because we're not always going to feel like loving God. <laughs> That's, that's where like our intellect comes in and our will comes in. We have to make that choice. Um, so I think it's important to remember that as well. Because conversion isn't easy. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's an <coughs> ongoing process and you have to be constantly making that choice in all the little things in your life, I think. Um, you brought in the word feelings and I think that's really good that you did that because this is an opinion, okay? I'm not saying this is the, the solution. But it's very important that you brought that in because love is not a feeling, you know? I mean, our, I'm saying, for instance, conversion is a, the poles are selfish or love. But love is not a feeling. Love is ultimately an act of the will choice. Yes. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, eros is a, the Greek word for the amorous love, the, the, the erotic love. That's where we get the word erotic from eros. That's the feeling piece. But Jesus took it to another level, which was the self-giving, the agape. And that's not about feeling. So it's really good you brought that up. Because this is <clears throat> saying that conversion has to show itself in action or practice. Doesn't it isn't always going to feel good? That's yeah. how you said it. I'm really trying to affirm you. It isn't always going to feel good. I imagine it didn't feel good. To, it, I may be facetious. It didn't feel good to be crucified. <laughs> you know, I mean, it didn't. And that was not meant to be sn uh, snippy, you know. It didn't. But as followers of Jesus, we look upon, there's a crucifix over there on the wall, we look upon that as a great act of love, or the great act of love. And it, 
it's not about feelings. I agree, but I also think that it's not a bad thing to approach conversion from uh, a not feelings driven approach, but a more beauty driven approach too. Um, if you think of the three, I think they're called the transcendentals of goodness, truth, and beauty. Two of those are uh, not necessarily accepted anymore. Goodness mm -hmm. and truth are necessarily accepted mm -hmm. anymore, uh, by and large. And if, if you approach it from the position of truth, people are going to have their guards up, their, their, their hackles raised, or even with goodness too, you know, with, with, with moral relativity. And so I think it is a very effective way, um, again, not viewing people as projects, but just living your life in a, in a way that, you know, through your will, but living in a way that's beautiful through our faith, which is just living your faith. Um, and again, like it's not, I, I don't think it's a bad thing to approach it from, because when you fall in love with somebody, you're not falling in, like you're, that's not necessarily an act of will yet. Um, Absolutely. There definitely has to be an element of, of the erotic, which, you know, I think you definitely agree with, but um, because there's lots of people out there and, you know, there's something that has to, to, you know, tell everybody apart. And so there does have to be some element of feeling in there to start. Um, yes. And, you know, I think that's a, it's a, so I, I, I think it's not a bad thing to approach it from beauty to begin with. Um, and living in a beautiful way and then moving towards like the more will focused activities uh i'm just yeah i didn't mean to put the erotic down in fact yeah, i would say I you well, no i i just I, want to clarify that i know a lot of people obviously because i've lived longer than you <laughs> that have been married forever and their lives are kind of flat and then i look at my brother and Peggy, my sister-in-law, who got the first wedding I did after I was a priest was my brother's, 1978. And they are still, uh, there's a whole erotic dimension to them, and they're like getting close to 70 years of age. There's just an, an affection there. And I'm really touched by that, because not everybody is able to sustain that, you know? And I'm not saying you should sustain it, Mm -hmm. But it's beautiful when it's there. It's, it, there's agape, there's self-giving, there's eroticism, there's just delight in one another's presence and how much enjoyment they have together and uh, the way they talk and tease one another and you can tell the, the depth of love there. I mean, you're right, man. You know, the, the, that piece is really important and not... Yeah to say, well, eventually it's going to go away. It's really great if it continues. And that's probably part of an act of will, too, to, to an extent, to cultivate that, like go, going on weekly dates or something mm -hmm. that, you know, that's, that's a very difficult thing to cultivate. Like, if, if you don't cultivate that affection, it, you'll, you'll probably lose it. Um, and so even, like, that, that side of beauty to a relationship, you know, which I think we're called to with God, mm -hmm is something that you do have to work out and apply your will but then through that like that the fruit of that is is um of of, of having beauty in that relationship when it comes up and it doesn't always come up sometimes you hate them not hate them but like you know you don't like them temporarily and then you like them again but because that underlying structure of of you know maybe it's the daily rosary with your relationship with god Maybe it's daily journaling, maybe with your spouse, it's weekly dates or whatever mm -hmm. that is. That, that underlying structure, which, are, which is applied and maintained by the will, you know, lends itself to the beauty of the relationship over time. Yeah, I, I, we, 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 we're straying just a little bit here, but we're actually on the topic. I yeah, just yeah. want to say that this, this straying into relationship and marriage is an example yeah. of how do we find God in our daily experience? It's, this is really where conversion happens. Uh, it, church, mass, sacraments is part of our experience. It's not the totality. 
theology, spiritual reading, spiritual conversations. This is a spiritual conversation. It's part of our experience. It's not the totality. God is revealing himself in everything. That's the point that I would like to be helping us all to, to, to get a handle on here. And my hope in subsequent spiritual roundtables, and I'll say a word more about that just before we conclude, is that they're going to help us all to focus on how we can find God throughout our experience. That it doesn't have to just be when I come to the chapel or when I uh, celebrate the sacrament of reconciliation or read a spiritual book. That there's God is presenting himself everywhere. And we all can give lip service to that, but then there's Liz going to get a massage and a woman that she'll never see again who speaks another language and Liz has got halting Spanish gives her a prayer that changes her life. And that had nothing to do with going to church or spiritual reading and God touched her in that experience. So that's, to me, that happens all the time. We just don't notice it. I'm not sure I think we're nearing the end of our time here. So I was going to say, is there any concluding comment that you want to make, either of you? I'm really glad you came. And I, this has been a great conversation for me. I hope it's been worthwhile for you. Definitely. Do you have anything? So I, I guess my question then would be, if the conclusion that we came to was that conversion is essentially turning yourself towards God, which means you are giving in or leaning into his love. And um, I think we talked about um, the intellectual part about that and the, the feelings part about that, the emotional part about that. But in both cases, you are turning towards love. And so, I guess the, um, is, is like the thing that brings everything all together love then? Is that the conclusion? <laughs> well, for, my, uh, for me, I would say yes. But it is not, but love in that big sense of yes. St. John speaks of it. God is love. Yeah. That the whole of every, we were created by love so we can join love in loving, if you want to kind of, that's who God is. We were created by love so we can be companions with love, God, in loving. And conversion is about how we get to be less focused on self, where we're hiding in the trees, and let God find us and lead us into love. That's my take. Matt, did you have a thought? Yeah, yeah I think um, what we were discussing with love and the will to mm -hmm. kind of ties well into the first question that I had of conversion needs to be a, a big call, but what, when it's, what about when it's not a big call? And um, I think that comes down to, to, to your will um, because I think um, the call itself is big of turning towards God. That, that's a big thing. That's a big leap of faith um, that hopefully should be exciting to an ex extent. Uh, but then the day-to-day -day things comes down to your, to your will of laying that foundation um, for that, that higher call of conversion. Um, and also when you mentioned with, when we went back to the brokenness of Adam and Eve um, too, I think one thing that I really liked about that is that that brokenness and embarrassment of Adam, Adam and Eve is kind of in direct contrast to the Magi, which you mentioned, mm. because the Magi, they had gifts. And I think it's important to remember that like we all have gifts and we all have something to bring. And what's interesting about the Magi too is that um, they're in a physical sense, they're like better than Jesus. Like they're, they're, they're adults, they have gifts, they're 
they have things to offer, and Jesus is kind of just a helpless baby, not better, and that's in, you know, no, I should fine. be careful about that word. Oh, no, you're but, fine. Go. Um, they are certainly have more to offer in the physical, materialistic sense, um, and uh, they, that's like a, a beautiful thing to recognize, too, is like, we do have a lot to be ashamed of, but we also have a lot to bring, and um, I think that can give us a lot of hope, hopefully. And as we conclude, I'm glad you just mentioned the Magi for just a moment because the whole of conversion could also be summed up in the end of that story. They went home by another way. Once they encountered Jesus, they couldn't keep doing the same old thing. They had to do something new. Their life took a new direction. So in future gatherings of the, of this that's what i'd like to explore how does god invite us through the experiences of our daily lives to go to continue our journey by another way that the way we're going maybe we're going to go in a little slightly different direction to continue to get where god wants to lead us thank you for being here and for doing this joining me it was great for me thank you very much thanks father Jerry. thanks for writing that yeah. it was good